We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and um, I don't know about you, but I am very tired, and it's not because I was up all night watching to the 24 hours of Le Mans. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm very tired, and that's probably because it's 10 p.m. for me, so go team. Ah, yes, time zones. But you time are not zones. in Argentina right now. No, so I do have a different background. It's not I'm not just Airbnb hopping. I'm actually in Uruguay, so I'm in month of the day of Uruguay. Um, we have a, we have like a million holidays in Argentina, um, and this week we have a holiday on Monday, and then we also have a holiday on Thursday and Friday, and so we have some flexibility. So I'm currently exploring Montevideo. I've been to Uruguay a few times, but never here. So I hopped on the ferry and I leave tomorrow. So that's exploring my, you know, new continent in the last few weeks I'm here. So I will actually be flying home and going home in like three weeks, which is wild. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely insane. And then on my side, I woke up at six o'clock this morning so that I can hike 12 miles and my legs hurt. I was going to say, how was the hike? Was it good? Besides yeah, it was, miles? yeah, I mean, it was, it was really nice. It's not, nothing that, like, distance-wise, nothing I haven't done before. Um, this is for the summer camp that I am helping run. Um, as I, you see, I live in a dorm room now. Um, they oldest kids go on a hike to kind of commemorate being the oldest kids and et cetera. Um, and because we are in a new location this year, I had to find us a new hike. Um, and the hike I found is really freaking cool. Um, but I'm not putting any spoilers alert just in case any of the campers who are coming to camp are listening to the pod no, in the unlikely should. event. Cause that's how we get pe- more people to listen to the pod is like, well, if you want to know details, you just have to listen to our F101 on the 2026 regulations. <laughs> yes. Or, or maybe we'll, we'll sneak that in while on, on, uh, on the hike. Oh, what do you do in the real world, Catherine? Well, you know, I do a lot of things, but I also have this little podcast. Let me tell you about it because you are a captive audience for the next six hours. <laughs> I'm holding you captive until you listen. Pretty much. Uh... Well, I did kind of spoil what this F101 is, but before we get into the regulation changes, just a friendly reminder, um, our F101 episodes are our educational series. So we kind of do deep dives, or I should say Catherine really does deep dives, and I play the role of the layman and ask questions. So this episode, we are going to not go into excruciating detail because it's super technical, but we are going to explain some of the 2026 regulation changes that were announced during the Canadian Grand Prix weekend. Um, and I, you know, it's always fun for a regulation change. Honestly, this one kind of snuck up on me. Like I, we've been talking about it, but it hasn't really hit me that it, we've had these cars for this amount of time. Yeah. And I mean, we've also been, you know, everything about the 2024 season has been overshadowed by the fact that silly season has, you know, started in February this year. Um, so it's, thank you, Lewis. <laughs> thanks Lewis Hamilton for going to Ferrari and screwing up everyone's ideas of what the grid was going to look like in 2025. Oh. Like we're not even like we, we we're, we're usually we're like so focused on talking about 2025 and our thoughts about who's going to be on the grid in 25. Now we're going even further into the future to talk about 26, which is like, it's so far away, but it's also like coming up very soon. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very interested to, to see the cars. There's some aspects of the cars that I'm really interested in seeing how they play out in reality because there's like, you know, it's one thing to have a, a design, you know, model in like AutoCAD um, or whatever, you know, designers and engineers use to, you know, drop these cars, but then it's another thing to see them in reality. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I know we've seen like some of these photo renderings of what the car is going to look like, but this is not exactly what the cars are going to look like, right? Or is it that is 100% the spec of what what these cars will be. Yeah, no. So for, before we dive in, two things. Number sorry, one. Sorry, I'm a, jumping the gun. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. You're good. Um, but number one, there's a very helpful video on the Formula One website um, under their t- um, tech talk section that breaks into all of the details and is going to go into a little bit more in depth of what we are capable of as I... St- 
took one, I don't even know if I took a physics class in college. Like, you know, I, I got a poetry degree with a minor in Japanese culture. Um, and the other thing that I want to sneak in here, um, which is actually true, even though Emily thinks that I t- just take random words out of a hat to tell her, is that you might hear in the background of this episode some sounds that may sound like bagpipes, um, because the campus that I am on is also hosting a uh, week-long uh, camp for a bunch of bagpipers um, and they have just been like walking around playing and practicing on the bagpipes um, all day long. It's been pretty quiet so we might not hear them but there is a chance that you might. Catherine, I swear like the noises in your recording are the equivalent of me like Carmen San Diegoing. It's like I'll be like oh I'm in you're Bolivia today and you're like oh yeah cool checks out and you're like there's bagpipes I'm like oh yeah cool checks out yeah I mean I, th- I think like while I'm at camp this summer we like I, we should do a series of like what are noises that you should expect from the background of my audio like children screaming because they're having a good time the train horn because Carlsbad has a very active train um the sounds of my roommates coming in and out of our suite so that is something that we we might be you know sneaking in but yes I just want to let you know if you hear weird noises in the background and we're going to try to minimize it in post it is because I am at a summer camp with very thin walls love love well before we get to like I want to know about the photo renderings and like if that's actually going to be a car but I think it's really important that we start from the beginning so regulation changes how often are they changed why are they changed what is the purpose of this what are your thoughts and feels on regulation changes so there are there are five seasons. So we get a different regulation every five seasons. So we had a regulation that ended in 2021. Um, we have one that goes from 22 to 25. So it's 22, three, four, four, four or five years. Math is hard. Um, I. I'm a poet. So we have um, rules changes. We have aspects that of you know Formula One cars and elements that have been banned or unbanned based on what the FIA decides is going to go into a, you know, the, the next phase of competitive cars. Um, these cars, the, the word that they're, they're using is nimble to describe them. So it's going to be, you know, it, 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 I think they're going to, you know, side by side it, you know, the current formula one cars are going to look a bit like a tank in comparison. Um, but they're going to be, you know, really agile, really easy to move and drive, um, along with being more competitive, safer, and more sustainable um, as um, Formula One is going to net zero by 2030. Is that the thing? I I think think it's it's 2030. 2030. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the announced regulations that, that, you know, just came out in Canada, um, are, you know, currently proposed, they're going through some changes. I saw that, you know, in all of the announcements, they said that the, the regulations would be ratified, um, in like, 12 days as of we're recording on the on June 28th but I think that's also been pushed back um, um it'll take a little bit of time for them to kind of put everything together and to really make sure that this regulation package and they are is going to be you know actually good um and I think that we're gonna go through another you know really major transformation similar to what we saw in you know going from 2021 regulations to 2022 which saw a completely different grid um and has you know continue to see very, you know, very different things from the previous iteration. Okay. And you kind of talked on, touched on it and like going back to my question before when I was jumping the gun. So, you know, they've, they've put out these pictures of what we think these cars are going to look like. Is this just some artists going off of like proposed changes with the car? What are, what are kind of like the big things visually, I guess, that we can see from these changes? So they're, I wouldn't say that they they brought on like a graphic artist to design this. This comes from the engineers at the FIA. Um, But there's, it's one thing to propose a design and it's another thing to see what's aerodynamically and physically possible, but teams are not allowed to do any aerodynamic development until January for uh, first 2025. So when that happens, we're going to see a lot of changes, um, you know, based on, on what we have now, which is a shorter, smaller car that's a little taller, but the rear wing is com- configured completely differently. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. Um, but it's, 
the, the point is, is that I think they realized that cars got too big for a minute. Um, so now they're, they're scaling back. And so, it, you know, big and they went from big and fast and they're going to smaller, but just as faster, which should lead to a lot more, you know, exciting, um, you know, competitive racing, especially in places where we have problems with the little thing called overtaking and say, Monica. Monica. Um, okay. I was going to say, you just like saying smaller cars, more narrow that just to me automatically triggers like more overtaking the tracks are not going to get wider smaller so if the cars get the cars have gotten wider and wider over the years now we're going back to more a smaller car which you know will get us back to the crazy overtaking um yeah i like it and i love it for monaco we know how i feel about monaco so. Monaco is great. We love Monaco, but we would we would also love to see more actual excitement in Monaco. Um, and obviously, we're still a little bit traumatized by just how not exciting Monaco 2024 was. Um, which you can check Let's out our opinions at that not... in that episode. I was going to say, I'm we can't go on a Monaco tangent in a different episode, but. There were a lot of factors that went into Monaco being not very exciting. Um, and obviously it was great that Charles Leclerc won his first home race. I'm not saying that that is, you know, that it was bad that he won even as the Red Bull fan, but I'm saying it, it is not the exciting. Ferrari fan, but, you know, I mean, I think yes, I think Monaco is just a whole, a whole nother conversation. Maybe it's its own F Formula one. Who knows? Probably. Um, but no, I, I think this will bring more exciting racing to every track with the higher probability and chance of overtaking just based on the car size. Yeah. And they're, they're also, you know, dropping the weight of the cars by about 30 kilograms or 66 pounds, um, which some of that is going into just, you know, the car generally being smaller, but also um, in, in some of the, the material that I, I researched, the, there are elements of the car that don't need to be built up as, you know, really beefy, sturdy, and heavy so that they can, you know, save weight in a lot of places. And that, that 30 kilogram number that you're going to be seeing a lot when they talk about, you know, how much lighter and, you know, Max Verstappen is one of the drivers who says that it's not doing enough to make the cars lighter and the cars should be probably a hundred kilograms lighter than the current generation. Um, but that 30 kilogram is kind of a 30 ish at the moment. Um, and okay. one of the things that it is pending is, um, the P new Pirelli tires that they will also be debuting in 26, um, mm -hmm. will also have some other weight saving considerations. And that, you know, deals with like the axle and, you know, where the, the car, you know, where the tires are actually fitted onto the car and some other considerations. So that number could, and hopefully will be larger by the time we actually see cars on track in 26. Okay. So here's my next layman question so a word i feel like is kind of the buzzword of f1 if you will is downforce and with all of these changes to the car it it makes me think there has to be a change to the downforce then yeah so there's you know downforce which is basically how the car when you're cutting through the air that exists all around us um how how that car cuts through it to make it you know stick to the um the track as best as possible to make it go as fast as possible and the best example for you know really high downforce and that impact is actually carlos signs in free practice one in vegas in 2023 because it was the downforce from his car that ripped that manhole cover off the street that welded manhole cover and completely destroyed the bottom of his car which obviously is is you know that that really sucked but that's an ex explanation of like how downforce sucks a car onto a street. So basically if you flipped the track upside down, um, the, the car would still be attached, you know, to the, the street, even though, you know, phys physics and gravity are trying to bring it down. Like that's, that's what downforce is. And so we're going to get a lot less of that. We're also going to get a lot less drag, um, which will mean better fuel economy and higher top speeds at, you know, faster circuits, which is great. And that, you know, for, you know, a regular driving example, that would be, you know, bigger cars. If you're driving, driving up a hill, it takes a lot more energy out of like an SUV to drive up a hill than it does in my tiny little, you know, that tiny little sedan. So there's going to be a lot less of that because of the way the cars are profiled, the way the new wings are profiled and the side, you know, the side portions and all of that. So that will lead to a lot faster of a car. 
And with that explanation, Catherine, I don't believe you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I um, also just okay. have a decent memory and, you know, read things. No, no, I... You explained it very, very well for me to understand, and I appreciate that, because I know, like, I'm not the only one. Um, That's what we do these series for. That is what we do. I, honestly, half of these series are just things that I'm interested in, and Catherine knows a little bit about, and just does a little bit more research, so go team. Yeah, pretty much. Um. Okay. So, and then you also mentioned that the rear wing is being completely reconfigured, so... How? How do you change the rear wing? Why are we changing the rear wing? So let's, I'm going to start with the front wing actually. So the front oh, yeah, wing yeah. Okay. is, is, is going to be a little bit, actually a lot of bit narrower. Currently, if you look at an F1 car, the front wing elements go all the way to the outer edge of your front wheels. The yes. new front wing is going to go to the inner edge of those front wheels. So it's going to be a lot smaller. Um, yes, go. Okay. So that to me is almost like a safety thing because right now the rear wings stick out and we see a lot of wing damage. People get called for, you know, the, you're driving unsafe conditions with your wing. So when it- Kevin Magnuson. I wasn't going to name him, Catherine. (laughs) Um, But so that to me is almost like a safety change as well then, right? I'm Maybe. not really sure, to be okay. honest. I think it's it's more based on just the aerodynamics of these new cars. Which and would make safety sense, yeah. safety could be a consideration. The only reason why I don't think so is because the front wing end plates are going to be a little bit more complex. So if you look at the current cars and you look at the the renderings for the new car, there 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 are more bits to the end plate, which will make them a little bit more complicated. Um so I think that if you lose an, you know, I think that honestly, if you lose an end plate now, it would have slightly, it'll have a big aerodynamic impact, but it'll have less of an aerodynamic impact than in the 2026 era, where I think that if your, your end plate is gone, I think you're going to be kind of screwed from a, from a pace standpoint. Um, and the, the way that the, like the, the three kind of bows that make up the front wing, the, you know, those, I think that would be heavily impacted by say the loss of an end plate and it would really necessitate a faster dive into the pit lane for a front wing change. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So then to move on to the rear wing, the rear wing um, is completely different. It is a lot lower to the ground, which we've had in the past. We've had these like lower rear wings. Right. Um, we're, we're bringing that back a little bit. And what you know of the, the 2022 era of, of rear wings is it has the DRS flap. Um, that is like one part that opens up um, when you're, you know, going down those straights in, in, when you have DRS that makes the car go a little bit faster. Um, now the rear wing is going to have three elements and this is us, you know, tr- uh, this is a time for us to prepare for the fact that, um, DRS is going away. I mean, I can't say I'm not sad. Like I love D- the DRS moments, but, um, I, it also makes sense. I mean, they get it. Yeah. And so the thing that I am, this the hill that I will die on, whether I'm right or wrong, is that DRS isn't actually going away, but the name is being changed and the elements that, you know, constitute DRS are just going to be changed in 26, um, which yeah. the biggest thing, and I believe this is accurate, is that you're not no longer going to have to worry about being in DRS range of the car ahead of you in order to mm-hmm. attempt to overtake. They're going to have um, a couple other elements that will you know, help add speed down the straights for these cars but we're not calling it DRS anymore. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And one of the the other things that they're doing with this new regulation that they did in the 2022 regulations and will continue to do is more efforts to limit the cars producing dirty air. So dirty air is a real big problem when you're, you know, trying to overtake someone and we're trying to, to drive close. So this, this next round of regulations is continuing to work on those efforts of minimizing dirty air as much as possible got it got it yeah 
Yeah, so and, they're doing it in a couple of different ways. Um, yeah. One of which is um, the floor designs are going to be very different for these cars, and apparently they're going to be a lot simpler. So think Williams as opposed to Red Bull um, for the floors. Um, but there might be some more complexities in the edge of the floor, like the part of the floor that you can see on the car. That might be a little bit more complex to help with that aerodynamic impact. Got it. It's so interesting to me. This is, you know, Emily's soapbox sidebar here. Um, welcome to my TED Talk. It's so interesting, like, the complexities of these cars. And then in 0.5 seconds, the whole car just shatters. And it's like all of this time and effort and engineering goes into this car. And then it can just be gone. Yeah, so we'll talk about safety changes in a second because they've actually made some some safety changes that will actually lead to crashes that look, may look a little bit bigger than they are. But before we want to dive in, I want to talk about um, Active Aero, which is kind of the DRS replacement um, and two modes that will exist in the um, in the car that will help with you know with speeds and configurations and these are things that drivers will be doing as they drive you know two hundred miles an hour. Um, but like I said, the rear wing is going to change into from one flap to kind of three elements that will move, you know, it will move in conjunction and kind of adjust itself in conjunction to um, what the changes are in the front wing that are activated in something called X mode, um, where the driver is running a really low drag configuration for top speed, um, which will help the, uh, the cars follow each other closely down the straights. And then in Z mode, that's your high downforce configuration as you go into corner. So it helps you stick. So it doesn't feel like you're about to like flip off onto, you know, the side of the the track um and it but this is where this is the z mode portion is not really an overtaking aid it's an efficiency aid and if you're listening to this um not on youtube i'm using air quotes because sure okay cool okay so this might be really wrong but my understanding and take on this is like the drivers are getting more modes or tools i guess for overtaking and this X mode helps them gain top speed, which is something like similar in DRS. When they open the DRS flap, they go faster. Um, so X mode like helps them gain top speed. Z mode is, I don't know, to make the car more efficient. Yeah, it, it's to help the car make more efficient because right now you have to downshift a lot when you're going, you right. know, top speed down a straight is completely different than how you shift when you're turning. And you have yeah. to downshift a lot to go from, um, you know, a straight to a turn, especially like these complicated hairpins that a lot of our tracks have or even some of the chicanes. So, so Z mode helps you like downshift like in a more efficient, better way, essentially. Yeah, that's that's what it sounds like to me. I could be totally wrong. I'm not an engineer. Um, but it, it feels like, you know, X mode is go fast. Z mode is to be more efficient in going slower in those, you know, speed trap portions and, you know, where you, where you have to, you know, slow down in order to function on your car. Catherine, it's like in a Prius when you slam on the brakes – it like makes that noise, but it does it really well. And it charges your battery. Like that's what I'm envisioning in my head is like for efficiency. I don't know. Again, I'm probably very wrong. To be honest, I'm not, I'm surprised that there's only two modes and it's not like a hundred and it's just train. I'm just also imagining this being like transformer and they hit a mode and the car just goes like, Rap. and it, and it goes. Rap. Um, yeah, well, there will be many other engine modes, I am sure. I, oh, I think yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll talk about engines in a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk about engines in a little bit. But um, this, I think these are just kind of the two big highlights of things that will be different in this, you know, era of car. Um, but I'm, I'm really inter interested to, to see it. Obviously, you know, you and I as Formula One fans have never lived in a world without DRS. Um, right. And I know that DRS... You know, some people have a lot of positive opinions about it and some people have a lot of negative opinions about it. So I'm really curious to see what racing looks like um, without, you know, without DRS the way that we know it now. You know, obviously I've watched, you know, every race of the 2016 season and also the 2005 United States Grand Prix and 2005 did not have DRS back then, but the 2005 U.S. Grand Prix was 
a hot mess, um, which you can also watch our F101 about that. Um, but it's, I, so I think it'd be really interesting for, for the newer, like drive to survive era Formula One fans to see how racing evolves in the 2026 era. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've kind of touched on this a little bit that regulation changes are coming in the last one. It's kind of like the changing of the guard almost because everyone has to start from scratch. They can't build from the last season. So a lot of things will change. There might be some movement on the grid. Um, Oh, there will be. Yeah, not might. There will be. There will be movement on the grid. Um, But no, I'm really interested to see how all this like shakes out. Um, Yeah. Yeah. What was I going to say? Oh, no. Okay. And then something else that I'm always interested in, just because room cars go really fast, we've had some really bad crashes and we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, not even intentionally. I was just thinking about like all of this work that goes into this car. And then, you know, you could be Logan Sargent and ruin the car every single weekend. Um, but safety changes. So with new regulations, we also get new safety changes. I think one of the biggest you know, regulation changes around safety in in the modern time that we've been kind of fans is the halo. So that's an example of a change. Um, So are there any big changes like that coming with this this new car? Or are we just kind of getting tweaks here and there on on current safety regulations? I think the answer is yes to both. Um, So the in 2020, um, Roman Grosjean very famously crashed his Haas car in, um, in Abu Dhabi in one of the two Abu Dhabi races in the 20, uh, 20 season. Um, and his car caught fire and exploded and, you know, completely separated into two. And it was only because of the halo and the survival cell portion of the car, which is where the driver sits in, that he was able to survive that crash with honestly, relatively minor injuries. Um, he, you know, he broke a foot, he had burns on his hands. Um, and I think he, he might've like strained some ribs, but that was really it. Like no concussion. He walked away. He he walked away and crash. He walked away. Very famously, um, walked away. And so that influenced a lot of the 2022 regulations, um, for safety. And then in 2026, we will have a lot of regulations that are, um, courtesy of Joe Guan Yu's crash at Silverstone in 2022, um, which, you know, was all over drive to survive because it was one of the scariest moments of the season. And it was the role who saved his life because he flipped over multiple times and ended up stuck between a fence and a tire wall. Um, And, you know, that was, you know, very, you know, that that was wild that he also was able to walk away from that with minor injuries. That is, you know, to the benefit of the, you know, thank goodness Formula One focuses so much on safety because that was not the same, you know, a few, you know, even just a few short decades ago. And we obviously know of drivers who have lost their lives in racing Senna, you know, most notably this year. Uh, or the, the anniversary of, you know, Senna's passing this year. Um, so we'll have a beefed up roll hoop. It will be able to, to tolerate more pressure. Um, and the sides of the cockpit are going to be strengthened. Um, and then I think the, the most interesting safety change that they're making is um, right now, and, and you, you it's the, the explainer that they use is actually Sergio Perez's crash at, at the beginning of the Monaco race, um, which, as we know, that his car kind of got crushed and turned into a triangle that he also somehow managed to walk away from. Um, but the front impact structure right now, it kind of comes away from the car in the event of a crash in one stage. It just comes right off. That's like the, the front of the car, the no, the, you know, the front wing, all of that just, you know, in one way. Um, right now they're going to add a secondary um, front impact structure. So, which is designed really to protect the driver's feet and legs even more than they are now. So if you have, say, Perez has crashed where he hits one element and then hits another, um, the front of the car the, will break off on the first, you know, impact. And then there will be a second um, stage of that car taking an impact if it hits something else. So, it, you know, if you hit one thing and then hit something else, you have a little bit more protection on the forward side of, you know, how, how a driver sits to the forward side of their body, which is, you know, their their feet and their legs. Which I think logically makes sense if I'm just thinking about it, because not every crash, you just like hit a wall and you're done. Like, a lot of crashes we've seen in the past few years, not a lot, but some of them will be impact from like wall to wall or car to wall. And so this is Mm -hmm. just an added layer of protection to help them 
against injury. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's a minor thing and it, it might, and I don't know this for sure, but in my impression of the explainers that I've read is it may make crashes look a little bit more like a little bit bigger because more right. elements of the car are coming off yeah. as it crashes. Like, as you know, like the, the wheels are designed to be tethered to right. the front axle of the car. So it's, you know, it's not the norm when you see a tire go bouncing, like, you know, last season we had saw, a, you know, there was a crash and a tire went bouncing and hit, I think Oscar's car and Daniel's car and like damaged oh, his in front Brazil. wing yeah. in Brazil. Yeah. So that's not normal. Um, and you know, there, so there will be further, you know, consistency considerations for you know to for keeping those tires attached and we'll also have smaller tires I believe um but this yeah this may make it look like some of the crashes are worse just with the way that the cars are going to be built to kind of like crumple right I mean but some of this just logically makes so much sense it's like and it's it questions why have we not been doing this previously um but I guess we don't know everything and we learn from cars and data so but it's it's yeah. always nice that they put safety at the forefront of you know the regulation changes. Yeah, I mean honestly the drivers probably wouldn't continue to drive if they didn't focus on on safety as much as they do right. cuz the, obviously these drivers know that formula 1 is dangerous as it is um and the last thing anybody wants is to you know lose their lives doing you know driving a car very very fast which you know, when you, when you see a lot of high speed crashes on a freeway, um, you know, th these cars don't have ne like necessarily the same considerations, but when it comes to, you know, the evolution of formula one safety changes over what 70 something years, it's all, you know, we don't know what we don't know, but there are also things that we were just physically incapable of doing in 1950 that we are capable of doing now. And things that, you know, we are capable of doing in 2024, um, that, you know, in 2040, we'll have a whole other new list of, of, you know, available ways to improve safety. But then it's also important to know that in the pinnacle of motorsport, whether it's, you know, NASCAR, Formula One, IndyCar, um, Endurance, all of those cars are like the top line, the top of the top. And all of that eventually does trickle down into the road cars that you and I drive. Um, right. So all of these safety considerations eventually, you know, move down to, you know, the, the people who do not drive 200 miles an hour. The consumer car, Weekly. yeah. The consumer car, exactly. Um, but speaking of consumer cars, we will not have the same, you know, energy in the power units um, in our cars ever. I was going to say, so with all of these changes and, you know, F1 focusing on going net zero, to me, there has to be changes in the power units and, and the engines. So what are the changes there? Are, are there, well, I guess I should say, are there any changes from 2022 to 2026? I'm going to say yes. Yes. And and like, what are the big ones that really stand out that will make a difference for performance on, on the track? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of them. First of all, we're going to have a record number of power unit manufacturers in Formula One going into 26 with the addition of Red Bull, who is moving to Ford powertrains. Um, so it'll be Red Bull, Ford, Audi, Honda, Alpine, Mercedes, and Ferrari. Um, and that's, that's a lot of different power unit options. Um, and I think that will that could be the part that makes or breaks a team's success in this regulation. Cause yes, it's going to be about design, but it's also going to be, did you create a good power unit? Obviously we've seen, you know, teams go from one power unit um, manufacturer to another um, over the years. Red Bull is kind of the, the most recent shift from one to another when they, when they left Renault. Um, and then they're like, screw it, we're going to make our own. Um, so we're going to have a bunch of different options. And I think that's going to make a real impact. But we're also getting a lot more energy in this, you know, V6 single turbo engine that we're getting. Um, the internal combustion engine power output is going down um, from 400 or from 560 kilowatts to 400. Um, but the um, electrical power is going way up. So, the, you know, when, when Max Verstappen complains that his battery is gone, that's because he only has 150 kilowatts in that battery. Well, now he's going to get 350. Okay. So and this is really, I would say, part of the effort to be cleaner and going towards net zero. This exactly. Like the big thing that we're seeing, the big change. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a big thing. And then everyone is going to be developing their own, you know, bio waste derived fuel. So we're moving away from, you know, 
fossil fuels, which is something that, you know, we're, we're, we're probably not going to turn Formula One into Formula E and go fully electric, um, but it will continue to be that hybrid of an engine where you have the battery power, but you also have, you know, the, the, not, the non-electrical power running on some sort of fuel that is bio-waste derived instead of just, you know, whatever you can get at the gas station racing fuel interesting yeah. okay um and is this gonna affect the well I think I mean that's probably a dumb question but I would think that this changes performance then if we're moving yes. more if we're moving to more of the electrical power versus you know fuel. yeah it, exactly so you know Oh, Formula E has their, you know, fancy hyper boost mode that they can use in, in they, ha- they have a certain number of minutes that they can, you know, use their faster speeds throughout the race. Um, and this is kind of, it's not similar to it. Like you're not going to have like eight minutes throughout an entire race of, you know, of being boosted. Um, but the current, you know, engine will have an, you know, a bigger electrical boost with this increased electrical power um, that will help with overtaking, which kind of goes into, you know, tying into what the changes are with the front and rear wings to help with overtaking, which is the the not DRS portion. Got it. Yeah. This is also interesting. I know, right? We're like barely scratching the surface here. Oh, I know. And- We're doing like layman, you know, articulation yeah. here, but um, it's all super interesting. But again, this is all hypothetical, right? we are like these, these haven't been finalized. Some of this could still be changed. The, the, but I would say like the minutia of it, right. In general, yeah. this is what will change. There might be a few tweaks here and there, but the, this is what is changing. Yeah, it, exactly. So the, you're, we're not going to see a lot of major changes to the, the regulations between now and when they're confirmed and we'll get the full technical book probably toward the end of the year. Um, but there will be there will be a lot of tweaks and, you know, adjustments to, to you know, what has been, you know, proposed and released so far. Um, you know, obviously the, the drivers and teams have been saying, you know, a lot about it. And it's kind of it's one of those like trust the process type things um, yeah. that does look like it's going in the right direction okay because that's what I was gonna say I know these just came out for Canada but has there been a lot of talk amongst the drivers or amongst teams I know some people were like let's just get through Canada we'll worry about this but has anyone like actually done a sit down conversation about this and I would I would assume like their main concern is safety and performance Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a pretty drastic change. Like 21 to 22 was a drastic regulation change and 25 to 26 is similarly going to be pretty drastic. Um, I mentioned earlier that Max Verstappen said that the regulations might not be doing enough to reduce weight to make Mm -hmm. the cars, you know, more fun, you know, more fun, really. I mean, that's that's what Max is here for. He just wants to have (laughs) fun when he's not doing his real job, which is sim racing. Um, But the, the real questions are, you know, are the cars going to actually be able to perform the way that they are proposed to be able to perform? Um, And also, of course, driver safety. Um, Because when you think about like this, these speeds down the straights are going to be somewhere in the realm of like over 230 miles an hour, um, 370 kilometers an hour, which is really, really fast. And, you know, insanely fast. Right. That's absurd. Um, And so, you know, car driving fast loses grip and then all of a sudden is in the wall. Then it's, you know, how much of these safety regulations um, are actually like, are they are this is the safety portion doing enough to protect words, protect these drivers. And that came from the president of the Drivers Association, which is George Russell. Um, So it's it, it seems like it's going to be kind of a pain in the ass for these teams to conform to these regulations. And obviously they're, you know, they're going to have um, a year and three months to build their cars because they're going to allow to start building in 2025. Um, but it's still, it's, it's, this is not going to be an easy change for the teams. So I'm really curious to see which teams are going to be able to, you know, make these changes and build the car to either continue their, their current success or what, what teams we're going to see have new success, uh, you gonna, know, on the grid. I was just going to ask you that because they can start building in 2025, but we still have the current regulations in 2025. So it, it, I'll be really interested to see which teams 
not give up on the 2025 season, but really, really look forward and, and look to the 2026 season and the new regulations. Because I feel like, again, F1 uneducated fan here. But to me, if you're really struggling with the current regulations, it almost it would almost seem to be advantageous to really go aggressively towards the 2026 regulations and get a leg up on everybody. So then you can keep having that leg up every single year based on what you learn. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's not always going to be the easiest answer. Obviously that is what Haas did in tw- like, they, 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 they said, screw the 2021 car. We're focusing right. on the 2022 regulation. Yeah. Um, and it, didn't really work because it was Haas and they have no money. Um, But if you look at maybe a team like Alpine, um, who is definitely struggling, they've admitted they got the car wrong. That I think would be a team that would, you know, go full court press on focusing on 26. And also maybe a car like, you know, a team like Williams, um, which is, you know, of course, you know, still courting Carlos Sainz as of, you know, June, 2024. Um, So you into this, (laughs) But I'm just saying that if, no, if they decide to to go full court on it, then that could be a reason why it would be enticing enough for Carlos to want to go to Williams. Yeah. Well, and and I I mean Williams to me sticks out as a team that would be a really good contender for that approach, just with James Vowles and his ex, you know incredible engineering background, how he's leading this team. They've struggled this season with chassis and they are just, you know, still kind of struggling. So teams like that, I think it would be interesting to see because, and I'd have to really double check on this. I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but whatever they spend in 2025, whether it's for 2025 or 2026, it's still in the 2025 budget, right? I do not know how the budget cap impacts or future car development. Or they just for the next year, but I'm I think not it sure. would be. It'd be interesting to see how many teams you know, carve out budgets to, for the forward looking car versus the current year. And that, you know, me over here, the money person, that's what I'm Yeah, you know, in, so. it'll, it'll be very interesting. And we definitely need to do a deep dive on, you know, the budgets and, and the, the money around Formula One, especially living in the budget cap era, which I also think that the budget cap will probably have to increase at some point, um, just based yeah. on everything. I, I think this, this first round of, you know, budget cap limits is, not what everybody likes. And, you know, obviously Red Bull had to take money from the catering budget um, and that went, made them over budget. And Everyone's going to starve. Time. Everyone's going to starve. Um, but I, I really think that, you know, as much as this is really big news and, you know, as much as, you know, half of the 2024 season has been forward thinking to 25 and 26 and beyond, I don't think this is going to impact Formula One much by, you know, by right now. Um, I think, I just, right. it's, we, we have, we have 2024 cars to, to worry about and continuing to develop. And then we also have the 2025 car and, you know, which teams are going to say, screw it to 2024. We're focusing on 2025. Um, and then we also, you know, in 25, we will be thinking about the 2025 car and the 2026 car. Right. Yeah. Cause I was going to like, I know that the regulation years kind of got messed up because of COVID, right? They yes. made it a year for COVID, which is why it's like, why is it? In that's why, it that's why the last one was short. Yes. Yeah. So it should have been 2025 and, but they've just kind of shifted everything. But when this came out, it like didn't trigger in my mind that this is still two seasons away. Like we still right. have this, most of the season left. And then we also have 2025. So this is really has zero impact to the next two seasons? Um, I wouldn't say zero um, because I do think that there will be elements that teams will try to employ in 25 that is leading into 26 through through the current regulation. One of the things that stood out in in one of the videos that I watched was um, there was a, you know, rear wing end plate element that had been banned that is now going to be unbanned. Um, And that was something that like Aston Martin had toyed with and had seen some success with. And, you know, we'll probably you know, go back into to looking into that, but it, you know, we'll, we'll have the influence of 26 on the 25 era, um, or the 25, you know, cars in the 2022 era. But I really think that as of right now, we're going to, you know, we, we've had the regulation announcement, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's going to be new and exciting. Now we're going to focus on, you know, the rest of the 2024 season and figuring out where the drivers are going to be on the grid next year. 
Catherine, that's a lie. We're not going to focus on this season. We're still just no, we're focusing not. on contracts for that 2025. Is 25. <laughs> Honestly, yes. Let's be real. 2024 yeah. is not a real season. Um, it's okay, so cool. weird. That's, you know, I think that's a really interesting take and a good perspective. Um, what are your your final thoughts on this? Like, I my whole thing is, like, the aerodynamics and the, like, real technical side is really going to change which will make the cars go faster and more entertaining for us. That's like my layman takeaway from this. Yeah. And, and mine is that I'm really interested to see how, you know, overtaking and, and attacking changes in a race. Uh, Cause yeah. I think that, you know, with the, you know, retirement of DRS, um, the way that that goes is going to change. And, you know, what we're going to have to call new era DRS. It's like how, you know, the Arizona Coyotes have left Phoenix. They're now in Utah, but I still call them Phoenix North. So it's going to be new DRS in quotes. Um, but it's, it's, I, I'm really excited to see what that means. And I'm also really excited to, to see the, you know, the, the, the ability to minimize that dirty air impact on, you know, close driving and how that impacts racing. Cause I think that we can get some really, you know, more really exciting overtakes than what we already have with the opportunity of, you know, less trying to fight through dirty air. Yeah, no, I think we're going to get some real entertaining races and some really yeah. competitive races. I'm, I'm excited, but I love the first few races of every season, especially regulation changes. Cause it's like some got it really right. And some, and got, some got it, it really, really wrong. wrong. <laughs> and there's a huge like gap between everybody. And then eventually we come together and, and now we're, you know, towards the end of these regulations in 2024, super, super competitive. It's really exciting to see. So, well, yeah, there we go. We have to sit around for a year and a half until we see any of these come to fruition, but they're there. <laughs> exactly. And I know this isn't a live episode, but do you have a F1 fun fact for us today, Catherine? The F1 fun, fun fact is that I hiked 12 miles today and I'm very tired. <laughs> Honestly, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, well, up next, we will have our Spanish Grand Prix predictions. I'm so excited to go back to Barcelona. I love Barcelona. It's so great. Um, we will have that out later this week. Yes. Yes. Ha, huh, time. Hmm. Um, I'm on holiday, clearly. Um, but that has been our F101 on the 2026 regulation changes. Thanks for going up, Jack, with us, guys. <laughs>